You are listening to Science Coast with Mallory Havens and Chris White. And today our guest is Teresa Bixby from Chemistry and Assessment. <laughs> That's so, how everyone wants to be known, right? <laughs> That's true. Oh, the assessment person is coming. <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> It's a four-letter word. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the beginning of the academic year, uh, the school year. The kids are getting back on the buses, uh, going to school. And as we all know, school is also associated with grades. It's a, uh, a topic uh, of, well, it actually creates a lot of anxiety. Um, and for teachers, it also creates anxiety, especially when the students are going to say, is this going to be on the test? Because as instructors, we actually want the students to come up you know, to think about the class and what we're trying to teach them from a broader perspective, not just a checklist, uh, the transactional nature, what is it that I have to do to get the grade, and, and then just move on. It's like, no, we'd, we'd prefer that you get much more out of it than being able to, to, to pass the test and get an A. Uh, there's like more. Like learn the content and be able to apply that information to different situations. And, and, and just Memorizing the knowledge is not really what it's about. It's about becoming, what I always want to tell my students, it's about helping you become uh, a productive citizen. It's about helping you become a whole human being. And it's more than just memorizing a bunch of facts or learning how to solve a, a particular formula and put the numbers in and, and get the correct answer out. Right. I tell students if somebody just wanted an employee who knew facts, they would just Google it and not hire someone. So it's how you use the information and process it that's important. And given everything that we know about artificial intelligence, it's not about producing computers. We have computers. What we want are humans. And how do we educate humans to be productive uh, employees and, and members of society? That's the way I like to think about it. Yet, because we rely on grades, um, it actually oftentimes uh, devolves into, all right, what is it that I have to do? Tell me the list, and I'll just check them off one by one. And, 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 and then we lose some of the bigger meaning of, of being educated. Uh, so I know that our guest, uh, Dr. Bixby, has some opinions about this. Uh, strong ones. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm just going to turn it over to you. All right. Um, yeah, we don't incentivize learning with grades. We incentivize a lot of other stuff. Um, like cheating? Like cheating. Like lots of things. Um, if you look into the literature about grades and how people learn, there are the top three things I'll read. Um, the number one thing that grades do is it tends to reduce students' interest in learning itself. Okay. Yeah, I can see that because it Yikes. then becomes transactional. Yeah. Uh, number two, the grades tend to reduce students' preference for challenging tasks. So they're less likely to take risks because if I'm – if I teach something in class for the first time that they've never seen before, and then I give them an assignment, and that's going to be worth some points, they want to make sure they get all the points. But what, realistically, do I expect them to know everything and get it right the first time on, a, on an assignment? Probably not. I mean, anything. If you're an athlete, if you're a musician, if you are a chef, you never get things right the first time. You need to practice them. Or maybe not the second time either. Or it, may, it might take a very long time. Or maybe you're never able to do athletics. <laughs> right. So <laughs> students <laughs> become averse to challenging tasks because they feel like they have to get it right on the first time and they're going to be penalized. So they don't take risks. And that's a huge detriment to creative problem solving, right? Um, the number three thing is that ten, uh, grades tend to reduce the quality of students' thinking. So if they're not taking risks, they are averse to critical thinking and creative pro problem solving, which in STEM disciplines is a huge thing that we need to pay attention to. Like, that's what we're really trying to develop. So those top three things, and this, this uh, article that I've got here is called From Degrading to Degrading. Um, oh, I get it. <laughs> har, har, um, har. <laughs> um, and I show my students this every semester, and I say, I know that the date on this is 1999, but that just proves that we've had evidence of how bad grades are for decades, and we still haven't changed our system. So I have uh, lots of, th I could go on, but Please do. do you <laughs> have any questions? <laughs> Will this be on the test? Will this be on the test? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, I'm actually, you know, my first response is I don't have any questions, but to just think about um, how deep the crisis actually is. Yeah, it's pretty bad. If you think about the standard grading scale of 0 to 100, um, 60 to 70% of that is failing. 
Yep. That doesn't and, seem to make any sense to me. And if you put it in the perspective of students, they feel like 80% of that's failing. Oh, yeah, for sure. Or 90%. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> they all want A's, right? They all want the A's. And and sometimes it's even even worse than that. I had a student at another institution who withdrew from a course because he realized he wasn't going to be the number one student in the class. And he was not going to stay in the class if he couldn't be the best student in the class. That is a lack of resiliency. Well, this is also a huge issue for equity in our classroom yes. um, and retention for historically minoritized populations because... They perceive, I didn't get an A, and therefore I'm not good at this. Even though they got a B plus, and that's perfectly fine, they aren't a top performer, and so therefore I'm not good at this, and I'm going to leave the major. Well, that's one of the challenges for you know academia is that we've always promoted from within um, based on the people who have the best grades. I mean, to this day, we still require prospective faculty members to submit their transcripts mm -hmm. so that we can look to see what grades they earned. I always like to see what, what they got their C in. That's always... <laughs> not that I hold it against them, but... I always <laughs> assumed the transcripts were to approve I had the degrees mm -hmm. I claimed to have, but apparently you guys are looking at my grades from, like, the early <laughs> I odds. I have not. I have not. <laughs> well, that's interesting. But the tran but I guess from my perspective, the, the transcript always includes um, all of the grades for sure, individually yeah. listed mm -hmm. for every single class. If the transcript, to your point, simply said, yes, this person earned this degree at this date from this institution, I'd, I'd agree with you. Yeah. But it doesn't. It, <laughs> I, right. I also had to submit the actual degree, right? Like the yeah, I did. The image yeah. of my diploma. Yeah. I did, too. Hmm. Why is that not? <laughs> it's like I do have that PhD because I keep telling my wife all the time I graduated <laughs> she goes, I was there I saw you when you were a college student <laughs> I graduated yeah. I, I, did. I can understand too how you can get discouraged by not achieving the grade that you wanted but not saying that you didn't get the content and Maybe that's another reason why they say in the science fields that doing undergraduate research is so important because, at least in my undergraduate research sections, the students pass or they fail. And it's not did their experiments work, it's did they show up and try and try to problem solve. Right. And that's a great opportunity to fail. And I always tell them, you're going to fail more than you succeed when you're trying stuff like this that has never been discovered before. And there's that saying that if all of your experiments worked on the first time, a PhD would take six months, not five years. <laughs> or three months. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, it's, I, it's in classes, right? It's hypocritical to say that we should do take learning. You should take risks. You should expect to fail first before you get it because that means they're going to get a C in the class, right? And, yeah. that, and then employers at job fairs want to see what your GPA is. So what do we do different? I don't know. Um, Change I, society. <laughs> there's lots of, like, I go around in circles all the time. Um, grades generally are pretty uh, subjective. Even if we put objective, like we think they're objective, lots of grades include did you show up to class, uh, participation grades, like those types of things. And that has nothing to do with whether you learn the content. So there are ways to, like, make it, as objective as possible. Um, there are lots of different kinds of grading schemes, uh, specifications grading or mastery grading, um, you know, redos. If we don't expect students to get it right the first time, we should give them opportunities to redo things. Um, and I know lots of people get angry about that. Like, oh, you don't get redos in real life. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've get, been given a lot of opportunities. <laughs> Like or, for proof. example, if you get a ticket driving, they don't automatically take away your license. Right, right. You get a redo. Yeah. <laughs> so there's lots of... Wait, um, wait. Is that another podcast? <laughs> I mean, did I get a ticket this summer? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so there's lots of, like, alternative grading scales, but um, to, to, to kind of take that to its ultimate extreme, I suppose, I've stopped... <laughs> you, you do realize this is being recorded yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> um i just uh there's a one paper in particular that i recall and it said if you they did a study where they gave students 
their assignments back, one subset of students got just the number score on it. One subset of students got the number score and a bunch of narrative feedback from the from the professor. And another set of uh, students got just the narrative feedback. And the students who got only the grade were like, they just didn't go back and look through their exam. The students who got the feedback appreciated it, but they still didn't do very much better than the other students. The students who got only narrative feedback actually went back and looked through their work to figure out where they went wrong and fix what they did. So they ended up having better outcomes. So does the number um, basically imply a finality? So once a number is assigned, then the student just kind of pushes it away and says, okay, that's in the past, now I'm looking forward. Yep. Yet if you don't assign a number, then the student is still engaged with the material. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're implying? Yeah, and especially if they have the opportunity to fix mistakes. And so I... I tried one semester to do both. Like, I'm, I'm not going to give you your score. I'm just going to give feedback. And then once you make revisions, then I'll put a score on it. And um, students still have a lot of anxiety. And that was, like, a lot more work for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to do the feedback. And students report to me that they have way lower anxiety in my class. One student said, um, uh, I don't procrastinate your work anymore. And I said, that's weird. Why do you – why would you – why would that change? And she said, well, usually if there's an assignment that I'm afraid that I'm going to get wrong, I will put it off until the last minute because I'm so anxious about doing it that I just don't want to do it. And so I'll just put it off until it's due. And then I'll probably get some stuff wrong. But I know there's not really like a consequence. You're going to give me feedback and I'm going to fix it later. So I'm excited to like get started on your stuff. Like I will prioritize your work because I'm not so anxious about getting it wrong because I know you're going to help me. So do you think maybe an easier way for people to dip their toe into this if they're not ready to completely do mastery-based grading, which for those who don't know, it's that you have to can you continually try on the same thing until you master it as opposed to like one shot and you're done. Um, maybe a way you can incorporate it into a classroom that isn't ready to be revolutionized. Mm -hmm is a lot of assignments that aren't for points that are maybe done in class and you give feedback on so that you teach them something and then they get the chance to fail right away without consequence and then a chance to maybe not fail as much without consequence, et cetera, to build them up. So rather, I know a lot of people do group work in class, but like change your content delivery a little bit so there's more practice and more chances to fall on your face before the game, <laughs> you know, the the – test the game yeah there's, look at me sports analogies <laughs> there's <laughs> lots of good strategies for um for assessments in class especially formative assessments and students get um anxious about well if if the ultimate motivator in your class is grades and you give them a bunch of practice work they're not likely to do it because it's not for a grade so that's Yes. But what if it's in right, class? Right, so in class helps. So having, uh, uh, I've seen, I mean, K-12 is way ahead of us because they're actually trained to teach. Um, so I've heard <laughs> a lot from, from K-12 educators. Uh, a really good strategy is to give them a quiz or a practice problem and give them time to do it on their own and then let them come together as teams or pairs and check their answers and check their reasoning and figure and figure that out. And then you don't even have to collect it. It's just an opportunity in class for them to retrieve information. So retrieval practice is a really great learning strategy. Um, retrieve information on their own, but then tap into that social aspect of learning um, where then you become confident about what you've done if you can explain it to somebody else. Um, and you, again, you don't even have to collect that. It's just good in-class, in I think, practice. So I'm going to go back to that sports analogy. And, <laughs> and when uh, when young athletes are assessed, oftentimes, you know, they'll create a um, a, a, a montage of video clips mm -hmm. where it is documenting what their performance is. And, and then they would show that uh, to, you know, prospective coaches if they want to move on. Could we as academics help create a portfolio of accomplishments so that students would have – um, almost like an apprenticeship. They're learning along the way and building things and creating things along the way, and then they can show what they've done in, in a way other than just, well, I got this grade, I got this grade, I got this grade, um, so that 
at the end of their four years of college, they would have a portfolio that they could show prospective employers saying, this is what I learned how to do, and here are examples of my work that you can then assess on your own, as opposed to just looking at what grades I got. Yeah. I, when I applied to graduate school, many of the schools required examples of writing, of scientific writing that I had done. So I sent my honors thesis along with my applications and even some places that didn't require stuff like that, I would send it in anyway because I was like, oh, other schools want it. But like, <laughs> it's it's a, I think eventually in the system, you're asked for evidence of your work, not just a picture of your diploma. <laughs> and, um, so I'm doing something a little bit different this semester, and um, I'll let you know how it works out. But in lieu of a written final exam, which would just simply repeat um, a test uh, of knowledge that they had previously in the semester, I'm asking them to choose an open and unanswered question in astrophysics. That's the class I'm teaching, astrophysics. And then write a five-page paper on how they would go about solving or learning the answer to that open question. And then create a 10-minute pitch uh, that they would then present in an oral fashion to the class during the final exam. Um, well, this is the question that is open that we don't, as a society of humans, know the answer to. And this is how I think we should go about trying to find the answer to this question. And this is how I would do it, and this is the resources that I would need in order to to do that study. And and we'll see what happens. And I guess I can use this all as a pitch to go to a smaller university, because if you're teaching a class of five, 600, it's really hard to do a system where you're giving narrative feedback to five, 600 students as a professor, or if you divide it among graduate assistants, then you're going to get different feedback depending on who's looking at it. So if you go to an institution, like Lewis, that has smaller class sizes, you're going to have the opportunity to actually have that more engaged faculty that can try these better learning styles that are better for people and not just transactional to get the grade and the degree. I feel, this is, I feel as if this is going to be a very long conversation that's not going to have a conclusion in Right. The rest of my career. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least I'm getting ideas for the new semester. Any last any last words, uh, Teresa? Uh, no, I think people should just examine the way they're doing it. Um, Grading for Equity by Joe Feldman is a really great place to start just to understand how unfair the grading system is traditionally and how you can modify it without going whole hog into ungrading. Yeah. yeah. And isn't like sm teach small a nice place yeah, to start yeah, too? Yeah, small teaching, yeah. I think. So really little, small one. changes you mm -hmm. can make without revamping everything to be more equitable. And with that, the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are the speaker's own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Lewis University. The material and information presented here is for general information purposes only. The Lewis University name and all forms and abbreviations are the property of its owner and its use does not imply endorsement of or opposition to any specific organization, product, or service. This podcast was produced in the WLRA podcast studios at Lewis University. Visit lewisu.edu for more information about Lewis University. You've been listening to Science Coast with Mallory Havens and Chris White and Teresa Bixby. Thanks. See you next time. Bye.